Hello, I'm Dr. Alan Chudzinski, Assistant Professor of Surgery at the MedStar Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C., and Director of the Colorectal Surgery Program at Georgetown. I'll be presenting this lecture on Bichette's colitis. I have no disclosures. In addition to discussing the epidemiology, diagnostic criteria, and treatment for Bichette's, this talk will also address how to better distinguish Bichette's from inflammatory bowel disease. This talk will focus on Bichette's disease, which is a chronic multi-system inflammatory disease characterized by a variety of clinical manifestations involving systemic vasculitis of both small and large vessels. Patients with Bichette's often present with recurrent oral ulcers in addition to other manifestations of the disease, which include genital ulcers, skin lesions, arthritis, uveitis, thrombophlebitis, gastrointestinal or central nervous system involvement. Gastrointestinal Bichette's, which affects 3 to 25 percent of patients with Bichette's presents very similar to inflammatory bowel disease. The prevalence of Bichette's is interesting in that it varies by region. It is more commonly seen in countries along the historic Silk Road from the Mediterranean to East Asia, with Turkey having the greatest number with 80 to 370 cases per 100,000 persons. On the other hand, in the United States, the prevalence is one to two cases per one million persons. In addition to the disease prevalence varying by region, the clinical manifestations of Bichette's also varies by region. In the United States, roughly one third of the patients with Bichette's have intestinal manifestations, whereas this manifestation is far more common in Japan. Bichette's typically presents in the third decade of life with equal distribution between men and women. However, the disease is often more severe in men than women. The etiology of Bichette's disease remains unclear, though both genetic and environmental factors are believed to play an important role in the disease development. In particular, HLA-B51 has been found to be associated with Bichette's disease. The pathophysiology of Bichette's involves excessive neutrophil response, vascular injury, and autoimmune responses. Bichette's disease has a variety of manifestations. Gastrointestinal Bichette's is the focus of this talk, and therefore, I will discuss its clinical presentation. Patients with intestinal Bichette's often present with similar symptoms as those seen in inflammatory bowel disease, including anorexia, vomiting, dyspepsia, diarrhea, GI bleeding, and abdominal pain. These symptoms are due to mucosal ulcerations, likely due to the small vessel vasculitis associated with Bichette's disease, as this leads to ischemia and infarction. Bichette's disease is difficult to diagnose and is often based on clinical presentation. However, in 1990, the International Study Group for Bichette's Disease created a set of diagnostic criteria to be used to diagnose Bichette's. The criteria are listed on the following slide. However, even with the criteria, it is still a difficult disease to diagnose, and making it more difficult is the fact that there is no pathognomonic test for Bichette's. Instead, patients often have nonspecific lab results, including elevated ESR and CRP. Patients with active Bichette's disease often have elevated serum IgD, serum IgA, and a complement levels. In addition, patients with Bichette's have absent antinuclear antibodies and absent rheumatoid factor autoantibodies. The pathogy test is the test that can be used in diagnosing Bichette's. However, its results have limited reproducibility and vary by region. The test itself involves inserting a 20 to 22 gauge needle into the skin in three places on both forearms of the patient. A positive result is indicated by an erythematous papule, pustule, or ulcer greater than 2 millimeters after 48 hours. A positive result can also be seen in other diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease and pyoderma gangrenosum. Another test associated with Bichette's is a positive anti-saccharomyces cerevisiae antibody. This can be seen in 44% of patients with intestinal Bichette's disease and only 3 to 4% of patients with non-intestinal Bichette's. However, it can also be found in 9% of healthy controlled patients. In addition, 
ASCA positivity has been associated with increased rate of operative management. Another antibody that has been found in patients with Bichette's disease is alpha enolase antibody, and this antibody may be associated with disease activity and severity. Despite the numerous tests used to diagnose Bichette's, the majority are nonspecific, and further investigation in this area is needed. This is the diagnostic criteria created by the International Study Group to help diagnose Bichette's disease. There are a variety of imaging studies that can be used to help diagnose Bichette's disease, including barium swallow, barium enema, CT, and MRI scans. The CT and MRI scans often show colonic wall thickening and can be used to evaluate for extraluminal complications such as abscesses and perforations. X-ray findings are nonspecific for Bichette's. This is a CT scan showing a complex inflammatory mass without abscess or perforation in the cecum of a patient with a gastrointestinal Bichette's disease. Colonoscopy can be useful in diagnosing Bichette's disease. The ulcers associated with Bichette's disease vary in appearance. They can be irregular, round, oval, punched out, large, that is greater than one centimeter, deep, and with discrete margins in focal distribution. They can occur as a single lesion or multiple ulcers. The majority of the ulcers occur in the ileocecal area with diffuse colonic involvement being rare. Also, involvement of the rectal and anal regions is exceptionally rare. In addition to these characteristics, the colonic ulcers associated with Bichette's disease have been described as volcano-like as they are deeply penetrating ulcers with nodular margins due to fibrosis. These particular ulcers are less responsive to medical therapy and typically require surgical resection. Complications associated with the ulcers include fistula formation, hemorrhage, and perforation. These complications occur in about 50% of patients with intestinal Bichette's disease. The following two slides show images of the ulcers. This image shows a mass with the ischemic ulceration in the ascending colon of a patient with Bichette's disease. This image shows a mass with ischemic ulceration with close proximity to the ileocecal valve in a patient with Bichette's disease. This image is the right colon and terminal ileum that was resected from a patient with Bichette's disease. Focal ulceration in the proximal ascending colon is consistent with an ischemic ulcer and can be seen in this image. Intestinal Bichette's and Crohn's disease have very similar clinical presentations, which include diarrhea, abdominal pain, and GI bleeding. However, there are subtle findings that can help determine the difference between the two. Endoscopic findings can help in this process. As mentioned in the last several slides, the ulcers associated with Bichette's are often irregular, round or oval, punched out, greater than one centimeters, and deep with a focal distribution. In contrast, the ulcers associated with Crohn's disease are typically segmental, diffuse, longitudinal ulcers with a cobblestone appearance. Transmural colitis can occur in both Bichette's disease and Crohn's disease. However, on biopsy on Bichette's disease, there will be vasculitis. This is not seen in Crohn's disease. Bichette's and Crohn's have similar extraintestinal ma manifestations, including uveitis, arthritis, oral ulcers, pyoderma gangrenosum, and thrombophlebitis. Despite these commonalities, there is an increased association of genital lesions, papulopustular lesions, and neurologic involvement in Bichette's disease as compared to Crohn's. Even with these differences, it can still be incredibly difficult to differentiate the two disease processes. I've included this comparison in table format as well since it helps capture the side-by-side -side comparisons very well.
please note that in Bichette's disease, genital lesions are present. The medical management of intestinal Bichette's is often the same as it is for inflammatory bowel disease. The primary therapies for treating intestinal Bichette's are sulfasalazine or mesalamine and corticosteroids. During acute episodes of Bichette's, corticosteroids are the primary treatment. This is also true of patients with severe systemic symptoms, recurrent GI bleeding, or moderate to severe disease activity. The dosing of corticosteroids is determined by the severity of the lesions. Bichette's develops resistance or dependence on the steroids and need other treatment options such as azathioprine and thalidomide. These two drugs have been used to reduce or stop steroid use in patients with Bichette's. Infliximab, which is a chimeric monoclonal TNF-alpha antibody, has been used to treat patients who did not respond to the first-line treatments for Bichette's disease. In addition, Infliximab is a first-line treatment option for patients with Bichette's who present with site-threatening uveitis. Currently, there is no protocol for dosing infliximab in patients with Bichette's disease, so physicians have been using the protocol established for Crohn's disease. Adalitumab, a humanized Ig1 monoclonal TNF-alpha antibody, has also been used to treat intestinal Bichette's disease. Surgical management for Bichette's disease is indicated when patients present with severe GI bleeding, perforation, fistulae, obstructions, abdominal masses, or failure to respond to medical treatment. In patients who undergo surgery, there is a high rate of intestinal leakage, perforation, and fistula formation at the anastomosis. Therefore, it is recommended that a stoma be created instead of attempting a primary anastomosis. In addition, disease recurrence often occurs at or near the anastomosis in 40 to 80 percent of patients. Roughly 80 percent of patients will ultimately require repeat operations secondary to perforation or fistula formation. There is no set preference for the surgical procedure or the length of bowel resection that should occur when treating intestinal Bichette's disease. Patients with Bichette's disease have similar remission rates with medical management as those who have Crohn's disease. However, patients with Bichette's have higher rates of recurrence and are more likely to require surgical intervention as compared to those with Crohn's. Also, there are numerous factors that are associated with poor prognosis of Bichette's disease. These factors are on a list of the slide and can include volcano-shaped ulcers, extensive ileal disease, ocular involvement, and positive ASCA. Overall, it is very difficult to differentiate Bichette's disease from IBD. However, hopefully with the information provided in this lecture and bringing more awareness to the disease, it will help in properly diagnosing these patients. I'd like to thank the MedStar Colorectal Surgery Program, as well as the few individuals listed here who contributed content for this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.